Hello Hello. and welcome to the Alexandra Wenman Show. I'm so excited to have Karen French with me on the show today. Karen is, oh, she's a multifaceted author and artist, but her speciality is sacred geometry. Karen, thank you so much for being with me on the show today. Oh, it's a delight. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's nice to do something like this in these strange times of being isolated. (laughs) are in strange times aren't we um Mm. I just want to kick off by talking about your art because obviously you've got a beautiful piece of your art behind you how long have you been doing your artworks for actually well uh art was my first passion from a very young age it was my best subject but it wasn't um it was something I wanted to study but my parents discouraged it completely and said I'd be a poor artist in a garret and said do maths you're good at maths and I was like (laughs) I can remember actually sitting in my maths lectures thinking, why am I even doing this? You know, I'm, I'm good at maths, but I'm not a genius at it. And I'm quite good at understanding different aspects of mathematics, particularly things where patterns and shapes are. So things like statistics and geometry. And uh, also did business uh, management sciences with it and carried on my art continually through that. I used to go to classes all the time outside of that. And then... Uh, as my life has unfolded, everything has a place in it. The mathematics was because I ended up writing about sacred geometry. It's sort of a, a tick in the box that I understand that aspect of it. And um, in my business career, I was thinking in things like branding and product development and strategy and having to look for why patterns in things that are going on are significant and how they relate to the microcosm as well as the macrocosm. And I've always been fascinated by patterns and shapes across different disciplines and I've always studied across different disciplines and I carried on my art was more traditional I used to do a lot of life studies and things like that and then as a result of the books people kept saying well how do you use it and I'd waffle my knowledge and I'd waffle on about different applications and I thought well you know oh it's fundamentally important that's what I write about my second book the hidden geometry of life was about uh, how There is constructs and reality. Geometry gives form. Colour adds the light and fills in the geometry. Sound activates it. And then the elements are these tools that you can use to create things by blending these five different things. And we have five fingers, you know, water, the earth. And it's a bit like cooking bread. You know, you put them together in different ways and you create different things. And I thought, well, that's fundamentally art. And if if you think, well... We've been given these and nature has taken these and created our own creative creations. And then we ourselves, a product of nature, in turn, use nature's gifts and all the constructs when we create anything. So we're always perpetually co-creators of reality and of our own reality. And when you, <clears throat> the, the thing about sacred geometry is geometry with sacred intent, because uh, mundane geometry, you just use it to make a table or a chair, but if you're using it deliberately, for the sacred intent and you allow it to flow through you, um, all these wonderful uh, <clears throat> pieces emerge that have light within them and love as opposed to negative emotions. So, and humans have been doing it forever. I mean, for eons, it's nothing new. It's got different types of labels because everybody thinks they've sort of discovered it, but it's been done for forever so uh when it's used specifically like cultures in india have their yantras which are geometric models that they then have a mantra to invoke the power of it that's their magical system if you like to create a change in reality in some way to bring in good luck or to to do something something transformative so i I thought well this is actually it's an alchemical process because what you're doing is you're blending geometry, which the alchemists did. They have round bowls, they have their symbols. You're blending the elements, so they took their metals and the chemistry. You're, um, they didn't necessarily use sound, but that's more to do, maybe that was a key component they missed. And um, also then there's the colour and the light, which is more the emotional element of it. And uh, so you're, you're, what you're doing is you're mixing and blending all these things to actually transform people in some way, to create a change, whether it's physical, emotional, subconscious, or bring in a message or guidance. And uh, so the artwork I do now 
is nothing like the artwork I would have done if I'd gone and studied it. And I'm very grateful for that because this is far more powerful. In fact, I used to be quite rude in my youth about abstract art and that, well, anybody could do that, you know, you're just plopping paint on things. But it's actually in some ways harder because if one variable is not quite right, it doesn't work. When an artwork works really well, you will always find geometry in there, ratios that are the golden ratio, spirals, positioning of things relative to the other that will be quite precise, even if you've done it intuitively, it's quite incredible. So I'm really passionate about this and I've been doing this for probably about, this type of art for about 10 years, I think now. <clears throat> So that's a very long answer to a very short question. I love it. It's it's amazing how we transform, isn't it? When we when we can't mm. go down a specific path that we think we want to go down, and we're kind of steered in other directions. I think I read somewhere you didn't study geometry as part of your maths degree. No, that was the really <laughs> weird thing. I did all sorts of very strange abstract mathematics and things like that but um <clears throat> because I did a joint honours degree I did two-thirds of maths degree and two-thirds of management sciences and geometry was one of the modules I didn't do and in some ways I, I sort of reflect on that and think well maybe I wasn't meant to get into the the real nitty-gritties of the maths of geometry because for me <clears throat> to really to use sacred geometry you don't need to have the mathematics mm -hmm. Ancient peoples, when they did petroglyphs on rock faces, didn't have the mathematics. Yet they intuitively understood what those shapes represented and what they did and how to work with them. So that's my mission, if you like. <coughs> Excuse me, I just have a quick sip of my tea. Yeah, my mission is to bring, to, bring that, to bring that back. And, you know, whenever I do my talks, I say, you know this, it's in you. All I'm doing is reminding you about what it's for. I'm not teaching anything different because geometry is universal. It always means the same thing. I'm just presenting it in a different way to help you understand it so you can embrace it and use it to affect in your lives and um, avoid the mathematics because it's quite incredible how a small percentage of the population actually have that way of thinking mathematically. But visual things... Everybody understands visual things, and it's we get much. It, don't we? We recognise it. I I mm. notice a lot. Once you start really noticing symbolism and geometry, you see it everywhere, don't you? I mean, we use it. They use it a lot in advertising, and I think oh, we don't yes. realise that we're being like encoded with stuff. <laughs> well, no, this is a, brings us into a very interesting point. And in one art talk I did because people are quite. There's a particularly now people have seemed to be quite obsessed with sort of underlying negative ap applications of things to make you do things you don't want to do and things like that. Now, this is a, it's a quite an interesting concept, because if I take, say, for example, I have a square here, I have a square coaster, right? It's like a stick. It's just neutral. It's not doing anything. It's just being itself. So this is very Taoist and Zen type of thing. It's not nothing. But as soon as I use it with intent whether it's negative or positive, I can use this to throw it at you and hurt you, or I can use it to do something nice with it, you know. So uh, as with a stick, you can beat somebody with it, or you can mix something, or you can play with it. So the stick is neutral. It's the application, which is either positive or negative. So sacred geometry does, can be used for negative applications as well as positive ones. And that's where you have black magic and white magic, because you will reverse the principles of it. So, for example, if you have a circle with light in the middle and the light spreads and radiates out, the dynamic of the light and that positivity spreads to circles within circles within circles within circles. So if you think of the middle being somebody in power around which they have the inner circles of power and then you have society revolving around that and then humanity, if that centre is rotten, it's a bit like an apple, mm. that negativity spreads to the inner circles those then embrace it and it spreads to the next one and it's very difficult to get out of a situation where you're in that particular circle so we use the term circle social circles knitting circles work circles they're they're communities if you like connected bound together by events and time and um, because the circle is all about time and uh, the middle is the the moment that individual and the largest circle of all is the entirety of the universe, it's eternity. Mm. So you, 
you are bound by the dynamic of what's going on in the center. So everything has a positive and negative aspect. And that has been people have tried to use that and use it deliberately from those early days to try and bring power because you can, the spiral draws energy to the middle. So you will try to draw energy into yourself. You will try to draw the dynamics of people. So you, whenever you're in, for example, you get it with football crowds, everybody's chanting and Mm -hmm. working because they're all chanting together. So you have that dynamism. And humanity used to move in circles all the time around a fire or an elder to really um, make that energy bigger, if you like. That's why you have um, meditational circles and healing circles, because you're working as a group to sort of um, make that energy bigger, if you like, and particularly its impact in the middle Mm -hmm. with the spiral bringing it in. So I worked in branding. I worked in logo design. I know very, very well how much of an impact a simple logo logo can have on people. And we all create logos. We create identities for ourselves. We'll have a symbol that we resonate with that make we make it our own. That's our logo, if you like. And we're our own mm-hmm. thing. So we're and packaging will have a pe- an effect subconsciously. The shape of things and the color of things, in particular, those two variables will influence people. And we are drawn naturally to things that resonate with us at that moment in time that resonate with our vibration. So if you're in a particular, so I will resonate with a particular brand of clothing and that, that identity because I, it is a reflection of me. So I'll wear those clothes or I'll take those, those things. And that's something um, is to do with the spiritual path is to recognize that and to start to become the observer and take your power back and start to look outwards and go, oh, okay. Because when you're out, not in your power, what you do tend to do is to connect into those and they become part of your identity. And as you know, it's about stripping all the layers of our identity away just to be the I am, not I am, I am British. So therefore a British person behaves in a particular way because I I am taking that flag and making it part of myself. Mm. Or I am a Marks and Spencer's dresser or I am a (laughs) whatever, or I'm a Chanel lady or whatever, do you know what I mean? Okay. So those are sort of tribal identities that we're to, just to make ourselves comfortable because we're so fearful of just being, I am, mm-hmm. going down to the shops in your dressing gown if you fancy it, and Wellington boots without makeup. One of the things I've been shown, especially with um, my system, which I call Precious Wisdom, that was channeled in 2012, is how to use those symbols, how to use symbols and geometry in that way. Um, to to harmonize and align yourself with your with your truest self with your it's it's really the that vibration of unconditional love which i see as neutral anyway it's like the zero yeah isn't it Mm. and just to keep using that you know you can meditate in a in a geometric shape or a a symbol I, i do a lot of um research around the golden mean the divine proportion and putting yourself in those symbols or visualizing them or meditating on them with the mm-hmm. intention to align yourself to your divinity is really quite a powerful thing and we know that they did it with the pyramids didn't they the great pyramid which i i see is actually being a diamond i think it actually yes it is there's the, the physical aspect and then there's the spiritual aspect which is underneath yes yeah absolutely, absolutely. which is why there are changes of position in particular places Tell yeah. me about, tell me from your perspective on, on the symbols and the geometries as like um, vehicles for consciousness, Karen. I'd love right. to hear. Right, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, I'm sitting back with my drink now. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, the first thing is to understand geometry. Firstly, geometry has been known about ages as being the blueprint of reality. It allows abstract ideas and us to exist. So it's, as the Tao, Tao, Tao says, it gives forms to the formless. So the circle allows the time, time to exist. It gives time structure and it allows time to have a dynamic that we can then recognize and use ourselves. So it has this underlying structure from which mathematics came out of because geometry was the first form of mathematics. Mm-hmm. That is really significant because geometry has that purpose to allow things to exist. 
we're all constructed out of geometry, cellular level, you know, everything's made out of it in different building, they're building blocks, if you like. Each single, every single geometric principle and shape, and I use the word principle to rep for, because some principles of geometry, things like the spiral you've mentioned, it's not, yes, we can see it as a shape, but they, some of them are static and some of them are dynamic. So a square fixes things, a circle moves things around, the spiral expands and contracts, um, and concentrates, dissipates. They, so that's more dynamic and it represents the life force which allows things to grow and expand and contract. So each single shape represents one of these ideas. So every single shape has a very specific purpose. They are not energy themselves. What they do is they work with consciousness energy to allow it, energy and consciousness to manifest, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and each geometric shape is comprised out of force fields. So you have the one, you have two. Two is one plus one, three is one, 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 four is one, 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 one. Everything's zeros and ones. So when you have that and that, a one and a one duality, they are bound together by force. It's about like, a bit like north and south positive poles. Okay, there's no, no such thing as lines. It's all about force fields. Um, so each geometric shape allows a dynamic or principle. And the key ones are between naught and one and 10. A 10 being one and a zero. Naught holds space and allows potential. As soon as you have one, which is the point in the middle of the circle, the circle can now rotate. And as soon as you have one, all of geometry exists. It's instantaneous, it's not sequential. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then you have 10. 10 is the limitless light, is everything that's possible. Because now the zero represents all of potential. 10, 100 million, gazillion, trillion, depending on how many zeros you have on it. So within those boundaries, if you like, all the numbers, they represent things. So circle is time, square is pace, three is a triangle, and also the diamond that you've mentioned, and also the hexagon, because you can put threes in different triangles in different positions, mm -hmm. and they will represent different things. So three, six, and nine work together and expand to 12 with square because it's three times four. And that's the vortex, isn't it? The vortex. Yeah, so you have, yeah, they all do... If you don't like, each one individually has a purpose, but then you can put them together in different permutations and combinations for a different effect. It's a bit like cooking. And that's why in magical systems, you have all these different symbols by themselves within a different shape, shapes over here with lines to them, colors, the elements introduce salt or whatever, crystals. And then you'll invoke them with words or tones or chants because within every single sound is geometry. This is an area called cymatics in physics. So whenever you make a sound, you're form, forming geometric sound fields that will come out as a sphere, a sonic sphere, and affect everything that it passes through. Mm. And in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was sound, because it holds and carries geometry through physical matter. So um, if you're talking, if we're talking about sacred geometry, there are these different elements where they all represent something individually, which is what I focus on. And some of the basic ones are the most powerful. You know, they're the most, everybody gets very drawn to more complicated ones, what I call higher dimensional geometry, where there are lots of stellations and circles and spiky bits and everything like that. And yes, they all do have a purpose, but they're all built out of these core building blocks. And it's really important to understand what those core building blocks are <clears throat> and how they work within that. So are you referring to the platonic solids as the main sort of... Their platonic solids are part of it, but they only they only they were they only limited to five, whereas mm -hmm. there's actually the number seven, eight, nine, but they the first five are sort of really important ones, yeah. And then everything else there's additions to that. So five is the life force, and that's about evolution and um, <clears throat> creativity, because five fingers, five fingers. Here we have five plus five, ten, the five elements which you blend together to make different things. And that's why five is so important in magical processes. And you put the elements on different points and everything. Um, so three is creation because you have male and female create the third, the son and the daughter. So you can have the neutral third, which is just the triangle. Or as soon as you introduce the son and the daughter, heaven and earth, you have your diamond shape. <clears throat> and that's a portal into. 
um, into what it is to be. It's into the dynamic of existence, if you like, uh, where six is fertility and fecundity. So, and that's why bees were revered and the honeycomb and the number six. It's, and then nine is the perfect man because you can't get beyond nine. Anything times nine is nine. We can never reach 10 because once we get to 10, we're into unity. And then, you know, you're not, you know, you're not experiencing life. You're not learning things. You're not. So eight is all about that journey, choice and directions and places and things that you do and your pathway, if you like, pathway of transformation. Seven is to do with change. And, you you know, you have, um, you turn seven, 14, 21, each of those time frames, and it's a bit like the musical say, scale. When you get to eight, you've changed in some way. Yeah. You, you've tr- In this elusive way, you've suddenly become something else. You've raised your vibration. So you have teenagers. They've gone from little children to teenagers, and then they become an adult. And as you go through, you start to have all these different ages where you are continually going through these different phases, if you like. And seven doesn't divide into the circle. It's always been regarded as a magical number. And abracadabra, for example, is based on the number seven because it's it can't be handled. It's very difficult to construct with geometry. You have to have measuring devices to be able to construct it perfectly. There's all the other geometric shapes you can do with a bit of string and a compass and a ruler. And I love the, the, um, the, the upper cadabra as well. The Hebrew language is born out of that hexagonal, that Star of David, isn't it? That all the letters yeah. of that can fit into that. Well, the Hebrews, their language is regarded as very sacred. Mm. because their perception is when you're saying it in a particular way you're invoking the power of god and if you consider that geometry is within sound and if you're using word within sacred intent then it has power Mm. so if some you know if i say i love you but i'm saying it i don't really believe it you know people can feel that Mm. you know you you know when people some people have a way of conveying words and you become those words you just immersed in them it is part becomes part of you that story mm. but uh, other cultures sanskrit as well not only is the representation of sanskrit letter significant um but so is the drawing of them and the use of them in in mantras so every culture has developed the language in a different way so sanskrit and hebrew have these very sort of in Arabic, Arabic was based around the moon, if I remember rightly. So it's based on natural phenomena. English I find quite fascinating because um, when I first came up with the idea for the book, it was through dreams. Okay, and I kept seeing these dreams. I love you, Karen. Can I just say, this is just heaven to me, this conversation. <laughs> so I kept seeing all these letters, Cs and Ds and Ss, turning into geometric shapes. I wasn't looking... I wasn't, hadn't set out to have these dreams or think about it. I'd basically been sat at the sink thinking, oh, I wonder how you'd represent eternity. And I was washing up and got screaming babies around me and everything. And I was like, just thinking about it. And then all these strange dreams started happening. And it was quite interesting how English, it came to me how English is a very descriptive language. We will create a word to describe something. And we'll have one word that is actually represents a sentence. And in some ways it's quite structural. So C words linked into the circle, S words linked into the spiral, D words into the square, direction, domain, dominion, spiral, sharing, blah, blah, blah. And it, it sort of kick-started my journey really was, and I had some on yellow stickies, little ideas. And I thought at one point I came up with this combination of geometric shapes, the square, circle, triangle with the cross and the spiral going in. And I was like, yeah, I've discovered the code. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. About two weeks later, I discovered yantras and mantras. And the, 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 the oldest known yantra is the Sri Yantra, which is known as the mother diagram. It's thousands of years old. And it's very similar i mean the principles were identical because basically geometry is geometry and you can't change that and isn't the shri yantra it's created from sound as well isn't it they've done it yes in- yes it is yeah so and how did they know that thousands of years ago it was intuitive knowledge you know and it's and it's also known as the gateway to the heavens so which is where i came up with the title for my first book gateway to the heavens because that was it was all about those primary shapes and what they do and how they work together in different ways. And um, 
just looking at them as constructs, no light involved, nothing, just looking at basic shapes. So how, and how they represent, um, this actually goes back to one of your previous questions, actually. They're structural, they're a blueprint. We can use them some, as symbols. Now symbols resonate with our hearts. Mm. So when you have a symbol, it is telling you something, it acts as a sign, but it's something mean, more meaningful than that. So each geometric shape acts as one of those symbols as a very, and so the circle is around about reminding you to be in the moment because that's the middle of the circle. The square is reminding you to be here and the triangle is reminding you to be I am, two triangles in particular. So the square, circle and triangle allow us to think about I am here now. And without those shapes, we couldn't even contemplate that. And those ideas wouldn't even exist. And then they also act as tools so by tools, I mean, we can use geometry to build things. Mm. We can build temples, we can create artwork. Um, we can use our body in some way, like through dance, to experience geometry and experience those dynamics within us. And then also to connect into them, to connect into reality, to change ourselves or get our guidance or insights. And again, that has been known about for thousands and thousands of years and every single culture has embraced that and done it. And sadly, a lot of people have disconnected from that and lost their way because they don't have that intimate connection anymore with it and what it can do for them. As a, so they don't recognize the symbols. As you say, once you open your eyes to it, you start to see the symbols. And then the next step is actually starting to use them for yourself as a tool and a vehicle for your it own becomes, transformation. It, it really is a divine language, isn't it? I mean, I, I love mm. that um, I love that symbols take us out of our logical, linear, rational mind and they, they open up, they kind of like the question mark, aren't they? You know, they open you up and you 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 recognize something in it, and then you're kind of there going, but what does it mean? I get this, you know, a lot of the time it's almost like the 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 age old, who am I? Where is yeah. this leading me? Where is this guiding me? What is this doing? Um, mm. When I started working with symbols as well, speaking of the phonetics and the sound, I started doing light language, just spontaneous, oh, yeah. like light language, gibberish. But what I found is it's not, you know, you, you talking about it going out, the ripple, it's amazing. What I find is a bit like these sacred symbols, it raises up the vibration to such a level. And I mean, with me, through me as a healer, what I'm able to do is when I use the light language, <clears throat> it's a bit like opening uh, another realm. It does sort of open up like a quantum realm. When I'm working with a client, if I use mm. the light language, I can do a kind of psychic surgery where I can see blockages of energy and then just pull them out of people's energy fields. And it's absolutely mm. phenomenal. It's like, I feel like this is sort of, angelic technology in a way and um mm. it's something that we as humans forgot because we forgot that we are divine and now we're starting to re-remember that that we're starting to open up to these extrasensory gifts and the symbols are helping us to do that we're re-remembering in a way well it's interesting because the sound aspect of it is starting to come back where that whereas that got lost we're sort of bringing back all the variables if you like gradually and sound seems to be in the last one because the power of the word is so important because you're instantly affecting somebody with sound mm. instantaneously. And that's why things like music and gong baths and all these types of things are coming in. And fundamentally, the key point behind all of this is intent. Mm. And the really important part of all of spirituality is to look at your heart and look at your intent. Because a lot of people use these tools and they're not necessarily using with the correct intent and it won't have the effect that they're wanting from it, mm -hmm. even saying light language or anything. And a lot of people, I'm continually working on myself, continually. Every time I get a negative emotion, I'm like, okay, what's this about? Or if I see <laughs> hatred out there or I start. Because yeah. when you're looking outwards, as soon as you observe something you've made a connection with it and the act of observing changes things so if you're looking out and you're getting any negative emotions you still to feel angry about a particular person that you don't even know or an event that you have no control over you look to yourself so like that isn't it you, if you point the finger you've got three points oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> as soon as you direct your eyes at it 
Mm. So the intent is everything in art. So for example, art, if you're using for art for art therapy, you're putting emotions in there, you're putting all your negative crap in there. And then I always say to people, you should always burn that because you are part of that artwork. If you're going to create any artwork that you want to act as a vehicle for other people's transformation, you have to be in the right place. And this is where like with Zen art, they will spend three hours meditating to get into the right place before they draw the paint their Enso, the, the circle. And they, they say that's that circle that they paint with their three sacred tools, the paper, the ink and the brush represents their consciousness at that moment in time mm -hmm. and they will spend hours meditating before they even do anything and they will bless all their, their instruments and everything like that so intent is everything and where you are and what your place is because if you're and i won't in a crappy place say when you're trying to do something for other people and you go oh, i'm going to do a light language ah, nah, nah, you know that yeah. will be coming that through will and particularly if you're using sound Mm, or touching people with your hands or anything like that. <clears throat> I did a video all... on this the other day. I was talking about, you know, we have so many, I mean, especially as a healer, of course, we, we need to promote our work. We live in a 3D world. We need to value our work. But spiritual responsibility <clears throat> is so important. And you Absolutely. get so many people now that just want to be these spiritual celebrities Mm. And I just felt so upset about it the other day. And I had to go and, you know, exactly what you said, go and sit with it myself and, and heal what it was bringing up in me because it was this feeling of, gosh, are we missing the point here? You know, why are we here in the first place? Why do we go into healing in the first place? And it's, you know, and I, and I confess I can be a bit of a show pony at times and I have to keep that side of me in check. But I did, I felt really sad about it. I thought, gosh, it's becoming such a cool thing now. You know, we were always almost persecuted for being the woo woo ones. Now it's become hip and it's become like this really cool thing for people to do, but it's now almost bypassing or um, people are just glossing over what, what the true point of it is. Well, this thing's absolutely, you see, I mean, it's taken me decades of honing my skills, decades mm -hmm. to be able to do something and click into a particular place. It took, been doing meditation for years. It took me ages to, understand with meditation it's a state of not doing and not and not of doing because we've been trained to do and um yes there are talented people who can instantaneously do something because they have come into that lifetime for that but a lot of these practices require practice mm -hmm. and i won't say discipline because i like to mix and blend things so you know you have that that's the duality of it isn't it you do have to um, have some discipline and you also have to sort of go backwards and understand what it is you're doing to be able to use it effectively and I'm not I mean I went on a massive journey of years of research so you know I've got piles of books in my loft to get into the nitty-gritties of all the technical and it all came back to simplicity mm -hmm. but I had to go into that journey, in that journey to understand what it means and what it's all about to come back to the inherent simplicity and that was part of my journey to understand that simplicity and the profoundness of it because you can't no, just don't necessarily get that if you like unless you've done gone through that and that is part of the reason we're here is to go through those journeys and to learn from them and we're not necessarily going to go to the top of the proverbial mountain instantly or get to our centers instantly and you can only really have a profound effect in your practice as a healer if you know what it feels like to be in your center and you work from your center mm -hmm. where you aren't projecting your baggage onto other people and we need ego to even exist we without an ego we can't have any identity so we do need it but we mustn't have those those layers that affect us emotionally and affect the way that we have choices we have to be able to understand that we have those layers and be able to move beyond them and yes, I agree, a lot of people are, they're attracted by what I'd call the sort of, um, the sort of sideshow skills that you can get. Oh, I can see into your mind, I can see these things, you know. He's like, oh, I'm psychic, um, oh, I saw this, I saw this. And then also they start to get attached to particular symbols. And that is something 
it's felt like getting attached to, attached to particular gurus or attached to particular people because they say feel safe with that person that person has had a profound effect on them or that symbols had a profound effect it's really changed and then they get they feel comfortable but everything is transient change is perpetual and you need to move on you can't you need to continue on your journey you need to keep looking keep changing symbols because it's not necessarily relevant anymore it might only be an instant that it's necessary it might be something that stays with you for your lifetime mm. but you need to be aware that you are changing continually guides change continually mm. how you perceive them change change continually you know <clears throat> and <clears throat> not to get attached that was going to be my next question. Was um, can you do, can you talk to us about your experience with guides and have you had angelic experiences through your work? Well, <laughs> um, I, I don't know quite how to put this because when you're um when you're having shall I say experiences with because we're very physical and very tangible and our senses are particularly li quite limited, our physical senses. And yes, we can, um, our, our inner intuition is something that just like any, any sense you can develop <clears throat> and tune in. And when anybody, when any being ex that is of a vibration that we can't perceive with our physical senses wants to communicate with us, they might assume a physical identity so that we can relate to them so yes, I have had, if you like, experiences with vibrational beings who have assumed identities, identities as part of my healing practices and training in various healing um, modalities, um, African ones and Asian ones and whatever. So they, so they, and they would have brought in a message to me about using things that are in the physical realm as part of my practices. So that allowed me to understand what they were trying to communicate with them mm. so yes I have worked with angelic vibrations if you like because they're a different type of vibration to some of those ones when they want to communicate something with me and they'll have communicated with me in a, in, within a manner so that I can comprehend it because I'm different to another person because of the, my upbringing and the way my brain works I have to how they would communicate with you might be completely different with how they communicate with me and the and the attire they will assume because otherwise I wouldn't understand understand them I wouldn't know what they were and I wouldn't understand what they're trying to say we need reference like, points don't we we need to yeah we do we have to and that's, imagination I suppose and, our, and that's our reference point absolutely and that's the key thing about symbolism mm -hmm. symbolism only has relevance in context context so if I go like that if I'm in a classroom I'm saying hello if I'm in a church I might be blessing you if I'm a being naughty little child it might be some fear based thing that I'm going to get smacked it only has relevance and context so my context as to where I am in that moment and who's trying to communicate with me they will assume different guises accordingly so I used to get um specific individuals coming through when I was doing art and my art has got so many different styles. I was like, what is going on? Remember that I'm painting this way. And, and I thought, oh, right, it's that one's trying to communicate through me at the moment. So I just allow them to do that. And now I do, nowadays, I don't even try to give an identity to anything. I don't, I don't even say, well, are you angelic? Are you a guide? What are you? I just sort of say, okay, right. And I'm turning on my button because I can, you can turn it off. Because sometimes it's just, overload you know if once they've got going it's just like will you please be quiet I can't handle anymore. <laughs> I can't I can't take it you know and that's in a sense all what I regard myself I'm just a vessel mm -hmm. I've been put here on earth with a particular skill set in a particular place with a particular learning experiences to act as a vessel and a channel for certain things to come through for me to help other people in their journey mm -hmm. and I know where my limitations are. There are certain things I cannot do, I cannot understand. And when I try to, it's like I have a brick wall. And it's like, stop getting distracted. It's a bit like these size skills that you get. You can get distracted by them. It's not relevant to what you're meant to be doing here to be doing. Focus on what you're meant to be doing. No so sense. now I just allow <laughs> it. I don't even try to label it anymore. It's just like, okay, 
So I, know not- that. I think um, I, I would, I would, I would, the way that I would put that into words is just that you're embodying, you're embodying it, aren't you? You're, you're just yeah. allowing it through you and it becomes part of your daily life. It's that I love that your book is like gateway to heaven. It's like, we're here in my, in, in my opinion, we are here to live and experience and co-create our particular version of heaven upon this earth. And you've just- And in service of it. ourselves and others, you know, it's part of yeah. our journey. And by doing it ourselves and shining more radiantly in light, it allows, we help other people. I love it when I hear people saying, oh, now I understand sacred geometry and I can use it. Tick in the box, mm-hmm. job done. You know, I'm not here to <clears throat> tell you how to use it. I'm just here, here to help people understand what it is as a tool set and how they can use it. I am not responsible for their intent. I do get, sometimes I've had people saying, you shouldn't be teaching people these things. It's dangerous. It's powerful. Uh, and I say, if I can learn it and if, if I can understand it, anybody, the books of it, you only have to look out in nature. We cannot be responsible for other people because at the end of the day, the only part of reality we can do anything about is ourselves. Our own choices. I people to sign a disclaimer when I teach precious wisdom because, like you just said, there is no way of knowing how what it's going to open in people. <clears throat> yeah. You're on that accelerated <clears throat> awakened journey, we yeah. have to, you know, we live in a realm of duality. It's all about balance, and and it's you know, it's each person. You will. It's. I don't ever believe that you'll be shown a path that you can't handle, though. And it, and it is about our own response like I'm responsible for me you're responsible for you and that it's like we can't be gurus or um I don't heal people no I act as a vehicle for people's healing but I don't heal you you heal yourselves yourself yeah you know yeah I don't call myself anything other than you can lead a horse to water Karen but you can't (laughs) absolutely and also (laughs) <clears throat> excuse me for some reason i've got foggy food today and for us some and also we're not we're not here to be in judgment of other people yeah. and this is something you know you were saying you're quite sad the other day i know <laughs> it's how people sit in judgment of other people all the time and that has become so polarized this judgmentalism of i have this perception you have this opinion no view is actually right they're just different points of view Have you seen so much? This has really happened during the pandemic. It's really been heightened, I've noticed. And and the importance of holding our centre in all of this is more Mm. vulnerable now than I think it ever has been. Um, And you see almost like attempts to drive wedges between people coming through. And then it's like, okay, (laughs) I'm just going to sit here. As soon as people get into fear, they're vulnerable. Mm. As soon as somebody's fearful, you can exert an influence and power over them mm. because their their shields are down and they're like, what do I do? Tell me, oh, where do I go for information? Who's going to help me? What's the right decision? It's, it's those fear, uncertainty, doubt, hate, anger, you know, all those things are stirred up and people do become very vulnerable and they don't know how to cope mm. if they're not, um, they don't have, haven't developed the skill set to be able to get centered and say it's all external things i'm here you know i can't do anything about those things can't do anything about that that's that things i can only i can only do what i can do on myself you know Mm -hmm. and you know if i get frustrated sometimes i've got quite frustrated over recent months us to not be able to do this or do that and i think well at the end you know then i come back and say no karen you've got this is an opportunity (laughs) to get a lot of things done I've got a lot of things done you know my third book which is about I don't know how many years overdue <laughs> and uh ask you tell us tell us about the books because oh, you, yeah you're up to number three but I think you've got more than this coming haven't you well yes originally when I had my first awakening with those stickies with the basic shapes I went mad researching and writing and then I printed out my book and it was you could have made a coffee table out of it it was so huge I thought well nobody's going to buy that it's a bit like Encyclopedia Britannica because it was all about my journey. So <laughs> it's like mine, I've written four thousand and... <laughs> words and I now need to, I'm going to have to split it into. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can give people too much information sometimes. So I just give people little doorways. So I took out lots of material, 
and I have a core message that runs through it. And I try to use people examples from different cultures and different um, disciplines and things like that to show that sort of um, how geometry works across every discipline is in everything and in every culture. It's not it's not unique to any particular culture or area because it is a universal language. And um, it was still way too much as one book, so I've split it up, and which is why it's called the Gateway Series. Mm -hmm. So each book is, is a sequential. At the moment, it's going to be about four or five. Who knows if there'll be more? But fundamentally, you have... Uh, got so the Gateway to Heavens, which is the first one, which is about the basic geometric shapes from 0 to 10, plus some combinations of what they mean. <clears throat> then they have the hidden geometry of life which I actually wanted to call the gateway to becoming, but there was translation issues. Um, so that takes those basic geometric shapes and then it adds, um, I don't know if you can see that. Oh, so wow. it's the gateway to the heavens. So it adds in light and colours and sound and the elements so that those becomes vehicles. It's all about co-creation, that book. Oh, you're giving so me goosebumps, Karen. Are you going to do a card <laughs> deck on these as well? Something oh, like yes, possibly. The only issue is I have to summarise all the preceding books before I can write the next book. So yeah. in the third book, I have to summarise those two into a little bit like that. So they'll get thicker and thicker and thicker. Well, as you no, I'm trying to keep them all to the same size. So the next one is much more to do with us as, as physical beings and the geometry within us and how we can experience the geometry within ourselves. Um, so the body is, a, body is a temple, if you like. Mm. There was going to be one before that, which was all about temples on earth but there's so many books that have been written about that and I thought there's just no point in replicating all of that you know I'll just, just, just um, flip straight to the next one and uh, then I have another couple lined up after that which are all from that original book which I just sliced up um, so that that material and those which I mean the next ones which I haven't even looked at originate from 2000 and something you know I've been doing this for such a long time now it's really quite odd. Thing. You go down rabbit holes, don't you? And it's like, yes, I mean, you need to know more and putting all the threads together. It's exciting. Well, they they all weren't meant to be written. They were all meant to be written in their time. Like the one I'm working on now um, has evolved enormously. It's changed into something completely different to what it would have been 20 years ago because of my own learning experiences and because of having to go and talk to people and communicate what I'm working on. There's a bit of it I can't really go into at the moment, which is really quite, well, which I introduced into all my talks and was asked for guidance how to do. I was inundated with, this is what you do, this is what you do. Okay, thank you very much. That has now become the core subject of that book. Didn't know about it all that time ago. So even the next, they're all evolving, all the next ones. They basically, I have been given the frameworks of all the books that are gonna be in the series. And then they're going to they're fleshed out as I am um, as I go on my own journey and learn the things that I need to learn to be able to communicate them to everybody. That's awesome. It so, is yeah. almost like taking like a whole load of whole <laughs> information and then being able to bring it down and ground it into these sort of more linear ways of writing about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, because the art is another area that I love because that is something I want to die doing. I want to die at an easel with a paintbrush in my hand putting some might might be incoherent art by that time you know but anyway and more recently I do get distractions I have got so many projects on the go I just unbelievable I just because if I allow myself to open up as a channel as a vehicle for providing people with toolkits to use geometry in in their lives something else comes in I'm like no Karen, I, what's please star, no what star sign are you Scorpio. You're Scorpio, so the water. I was not wondering if you, I'm Libra, I'm air, but the air and water, we seem to be really similar in that, you know, really fluid, lots of things on the go. Yeah. I'm Pisces moon, so that's water. Well, I sort of, um, what was it, 2019, I was at a little local event and my yoga teacher was doing, and I, she said, oh, would you mind if this guy shared your table? your gazebo yeah okay yeah yeah he's a pub he writes books and anyway it was this young gentleman who was part of a small publishing company a tiny little publishing company and they 
do oracle decks and things on veganism and such like. <clears throat> so I shared my table with him and we got him chatting and he wanted me to do a deck for him and we went for lunch and I said, well, what drives you? And he's very into games, board games and card games. He absolutely loves them. It's a huge market. It's gone phenomenal. Oh, that's very interesting. Oh, nice. And went home that night and he loves it and he wants to have a business making games. So I went to bed that night. Boom. Oh, my God. <laughs> Games after games after games after games coming through. And it's like, really? Really? I had I'd never set out. I didn't think, I am going to make a game. I'm going to go and create a game. I'm going to sit at the dining table and go ponder, ponder, ponder. It's a bit like the books. I never set out to write books. And it's like, oh, okay, right. I understand. I have all the vehicle. I have all the skills to create this. I'm numerate. I understand the geometry of the games. I understand the dynamics of strategy and planning. I understand... How they, I understand how working with this can actually change you. Okay, I get it. I'm a channel for this. All right. But it got to the point. It became a major distraction for over a year because it was just like download after download after download. So now I've got about 10 games in the <laughs> pipe work. The first one is coming up next autumn, which I did a bespoke one for the company, for this company. And some of them are to do with spirituality and some of them are family games you know but there's an element of it in there but it's not it's a family game it? but that's all community uh, anyway isn't it you yeah know, so get... another distraction yeah so i've got <laughs> and but they're all fundamentally products of the skill sets that i have been given here in this lifetime mm. and that i think is key to really understand yourself well what am i what are my skill sets what am i contributing when people say, oh, what's my journey? What's my path? What am I here to do? I say, well, look at to yourself. What is it that you fundamentally are good at? Are you an amazing person at nurturing other people? You know, is this something, because I'm, I'm a people person that I can talk to a lot of diverse people. I can understand, um, I'm very good at understanding people from different disciplines and being able to translate across them, but I wouldn't be able to do translation of languages. It gets in one ear and out the other. And, and communicating complicated ideas in simple ways through visual mediums. And that's mm -hmm. what I used to do in my business, communicate complex software architectures through tool, you know, or a strategy or a plan. Um, so understand yourself. What is it that you do? What is that so unique about you and your skill set? We all have the inherent ability to be healers. We're all here as co-creators. We're all here to develop ourselves. And also we always will be affecting other people and we're always changing. And it's always, and it's sort of seeing your place within that mm. uh, dynamic and not trying to be somebody else, mm. being, your, being you and doing things in your way and the way that, because then you will be working with people that are drawn to you because of your vibration, you know, because of the way that you do it. Yes, honour and embrace your uniqueness. We're all like Absolutely. Said, can't we? Mm. And don't try to be somebody else. I remember when I did my very, very first talk, I was so terrified. I mean, we're going back a long time ago. And I used to do presentations all the time in business too, you know. That was... But people had to be in that meeting room. Tough. You've got to listen to me. First time I did a big talk and it was 150 people or something. I was going, what universe? What? <laughs> Why? And people had paid to be there. And I was so nervous. I was on the toilet before and I was clutching. The ass. <laughs> and <clears throat> it immediately struck me. I'm there to entertain people. And I can only say things in a very simple way and only a certain amount of information. And I have to be true to myself. I was looking at other people in their presentations because how do they do it? Oh, maybe I should do it like that. Or maybe I should do it like that. Um, oh, that they do it really well. And it, that first thing, it was like, I have to do it in my way. Mm. And, but I have to do it in a way that people are going to find interesting and not go to sleep. Because there's one guy at the back going, <sighs> then I realised some people just zone out anyway when I'm doing my presentations because they're off and then they're suddenly like, whoa, whoa, at the end of it. And at the end of this presentation, I was sat there, I started working. Oh, thank God that's over. Oh, I got really stressed, letting the stress go. And there's young lady came up with her mum to ask a question and she came and stood in front of me and went and then ran off I was like, weird. 
Why she knows about She's starstruck. <laughs> she's very nervous because she's in awe of you and she doesn't, and I was like, you know, and that's something thorned me. Oh my, you know, people will be worried about because they put me in a pedestal and the last thing I want to be is on a pedestal. That's the last place I want to be because if you put yourself on a pedestal above other people, you will have a nice big fat fall at oh, some yeah. point. Oh, yeah, the rug will come out <laughs> from under you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We don't, that's part of judging other people. We should never put ourselves on the pedestal. So and Likewise, don't put yourself underneath them either. No, you mixing with them. Mm. So, yeah, that was uh, my first experience. Now it's just like, hi, hello, everybody. <laughs> Do my talk. What you take from it, you take from it. If you don't agree, if you don't agree. I know it is what it is. I love it. You've got such a beautiful delivery and way of putting it. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's just you'll be just being yourself. It's fantastic. As soon as you're yourself. Yeah. But it's like anything else. You know, um, I have got a very soft voice. And I know that, even though inside my head I sound like I'm yelling at people. So I had to sort of develop that and I had to develop my delivery because you, you and then that's why I wave my arms around an awful lot more than I used to, used to because I'd be talking about, you know, dynamics of things. And if you go it's through that, circle, way, you know. <laughs> so my family always going, stop waving your arms around, you wave your arms around. You know. Anyway, um, but uh, yeah, you have to develop that as a skill you know in terms of knowing your material and being comfortable being comfortable with yourself it makes such a difference and know your stuff and uh, and nothing is ever complete or true we know very little humility I know so much x amount and I will meet other people because I cover so many subjects who are experts in a particular field I'm not an expert in every single field but even they aren't an expert you know if there is just so so much out there we just don't know because we are limited by our physicality and I can only help people in a certain way but I don't know everything I know no I don't know everything it's mm. just never nobody, lose your curiosity. nobody knows everything you know <laughs> never lose your curiosity though that's what that's my motto exactly. I'm not always I'm like terrible. I get into everything. I'm like, I want to know. I want to know more, 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 more. Mm. Amazing. But it's, you know, I, I frustrate myself because I, I don't have a mathematical brain really. I failed maths at school. And so I'm trying to grasp the mathematics of it. I mean, if they taught geometry and sacred geometry, I would have been right in there. I probably would have aced it. But it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Well, they don't relate numbers to geometry. So if you were to... And so somebody, oh God knows, no told me that the only way she actually got her child because of their particular issues that they had to understand numbers was to relate it to shapes, that the number four is the square. And they got it immediately. Mm -hmm. So then numbers started making sense to them because we're taught things separately in little boxes, not how they work together. Yes. You know, well, and you taught the that, patterns you can see. <clears throat> yeah, and what those... Mm. represent what those numbers represent as ideas and why they then have become our mathematical systems you know you can I did think about doing a sacred geometry book for kids with that but I think other people have done it now so that project's not happening anymore might you sound like you've got enough on your plate <laughs> girl <laughs> yeah <laughs> too many ideas and well, I'm really excited about your... So when will your next book come out? Do you know? Do you have the date yet? Well, I'm sure my publisher would like to know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm in the, the last throes of the manuscript. And my, my books take years mm. to consolidate. And then um, because they are for lots and lots of illustrations, you know, yeah. each of those two pages, those spreads involve a lot of collection of books and they, they have to work as a spread. It's quite a long process to do. And I've got an awful lot of illustrations. So it'd be probably about six months of work there. And then, <coughs> and then they have to work to their publishing schedule. So Christ, I'll be lucky to get it out next year in terms of probably be towards the end of next year. I'll have to keep that, our eyes peeled for it. And then maybe maybe yeah. you can come on again and talk about it when it comes out. Oh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. 
Well, Karen, it's been so amazing to talk to you. I could talk to you for hours more, honestly. Like, you're so fascinating. Um, have, you, have you got any passing, um, parting, sorry, words for <laughs> our words before we go? Well, let's think. Be true to yourself. Um, always, always work on yourself. And look around you. Be more observant about what's around you. And sacred geometry is not difficult. It's not complicated. And it is something that everybody can understand and use. So I think that would probably be, and also use it in your life. Love it. I love it. And just um, so people know how to get hold of you, what's your website? And uh... Uh, KarenLFrench.com. And the L is significant because then um, there's a Karen French photographer in America. So L, Karen L French and I have a YouTube channel where I do uh, at the moment I'm trying to do a meditation a week it's proven quite challenging oh, that's based on based on my artwork um, just short ones like 10 15 minute ones I've been doing that over recent months just to try and help people that's great I'll share all the links yep. below so everyone can just go below the, the interview and click on them and find thank them. you very much that's, that's lovely. lovely thank, thank you, you Alexandria thank you very much for interviewing me it's um, been fun it's been oh, so nice to do something like this again so such an absolute pleasure to connect with you too lovely and to to talk to you about all your knowledge oh my gosh we could go on for ages and i love and i have to say to our viewers that as we record this it's just turned 11 11 as we complete i love it <laughs> i'll make it up in you. <laughs> karen thank you so, so thank you very much and um hope to speak to you soon and to everyone who's joined us thank you so much for watching mm -hmm.